Welcome to The Joe Cohen Show. Join me as I share my experience with biohacking and invite top health experts to explore the latest technology, supplements, research, and resources for optimizing your body and brain. Hey, everyone. I'm here with Emil Bakker. Hope I pronounced your name correctly. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Okay. And the reason why I'm really excited to have you on today is, I mean, you have tons of experience in supplements and biohacking, and you've been in this field for a while. You're the mm -hmm. product specialist at Nootropics Depot and Natrium Health. And that's a place where I started to get a lot more supplements because they have some unique extractions. And when mm -hmm. it comes to natural substances, the extraction is pretty much almost, it could be almost everything, right? The difference between having a crap product and that doesn't work and a product that does work, right? It, it, it's Absolutely. less important for something like that's a purified chemical, like let's say, or purified mm -hmm. biological substance, like inositol or cysteine or anything that's just purified. But if you have an herb, then, you know, if lion's mane, so I just, as an example, I, I've taken, I don't know, five to 10 lion's manes and I get a different effect from each one. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Because there's big differences in how it's being grown, how it's being extracted, and also what different cultivars are being grown. Because I think a lot of people just think a lion's mane, it's a mushroom. It, it will always be the same. But if right. you look at like a tomato, you can have a red tomato that's small, like a cherry tomato, or you can have one that's like a little bit more gnarled and different colors and green and stuff like that. And yet kind of have the same lion's mane, but then yeah, who's controlling for that at, at this point in time? I don't think anyone is. Right. So yeah. So basically, first of all, thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Of course. And, and I think that we could get right into, let's say lion's mane. Because actually, it's one of those things. I think it's a good example of one of those things that there's a lot of different variations. And mm -hmm. I want to know what are what what is each supplement company, or you don't maybe have to give the exact names, but what are each of these supplements doing that I'm getting different reactions from each of them? And what are the different types that the Nootropics Depot sells, and and which one do you prefer the most? So take us through a journey of Linesman. Yeah. So I think one really important thing to understand first is when it comes to botanicals and mushrooms, testing is kind of everything. So I think a lot of companies are not doing super in-depth analytical testing all the time. And so there can be some inconsistencies there. We try and do our best to always get the analytical chemistry shored up as much as possible. So we've been doing that a lot with Lion's Mane. And one thing we've very quickly realized is that a lot of mushroom products in the industry are not actual fruiting body products. So mushrooms can exist as the fruiting body, which is the actual mushroom, or it can exist as the mycelium. And the mycelium and the fruiting bodies are both beneficial. But in the kind of the industry standard is that fruiting bodies are not necessarily always being grown, nor is like liquid culture mycelium. What's being done is you're taking the mycelium, you're growing it on grains, something like brown rice, for example, which you do see that on a lot of different supplement fact labels. I don't necessarily want to call anyone out, but there are certain products. If you look at the label, it will say myceliated brown rice. So what that means is that they're growing mycelium on brown rice or some sort of grain and then grinding it all up. They're not separating it. So you're not really getting a mushroom product. You're getting a little bit of mycelium mixed in with a lot of grains. And there can still be some beneficial bioactive compounds in mycelium on grain. But basically, that step is kind of the first step in traditional mushroom cultivation. So you basically take the mycelium, you culture it on a grain, and then you take that grain and you put it in a substrate. For lion's mane, that would be a substrate that has some wood in there. Usually it's oak and some sort of nitrogen source like soy hulls, soybean hulls is commonly used. And then you take those myceliated grains and you inoculate the substrate with those myceliated grains and then you cultivate fruiting bodies from there. So a lot of companies are basically just 
stopping the process early on because it's cheap. And then you have mycelium on grain. So I think if you've ever tried a mycelium on grain product, those are going to feel the most different or you're not going to get much of a feeling at all. And then... Okay, so, I mean, I think, just give me a rough number of, like, like in your experience, what percentage of, of these mushroom products, and maybe it doesn't necessarily have to even be lion's mane, but are they grown in this way on grain and in, in this inferior way? So what percentage of the, the ones that are sold on the market would you assume are this variety? So through our testing, I think a, a lot of them are of this kind of variety, especially if you're just buying a random lion's mane product on Amazon, chances are you're getting a mycelium on grain product, especially if it's cheap. And we've gone through, there's a really easy way in which you can determine whether it is mycelium on grain because mushrooms produce a type of starch called a beta-glucan. And you also have starches, which are alpha-glucans. And alpha-glucans don't necessarily occur in the fruiting body in large percentages, but alpha-glucans do exist in grains in large percentages. So we've been doing this testing where we can test for alpha and beta-glucans. And if you see very high alpha-glucan levels, but the product is claiming it is fruiting body, then we can see, well, fruiting body doesn't contain that level of alpha-glucans, so it must be mycelium on grain. And if we've gone through and tested a lot of different products that claim this is fruiting body or this is pure mycelium, we see really high alpha-glucan levels and then we can determine, okay, it is mycelium on grain. It's hard to put a, a precise value on it, but we see it more often than not. There's definitely a lot of good mushroom manufacturers out there, especially the, the smaller companies, I think, are doing it well. But some of the bigger, more well-known ones that we've tested are usually mycelium on grain. And that's not necessarily oh, to say, yeah, the big ones are doing it because they, they want to create as much as possible. Actually, here's a good way to, to determine. If it is a bigger company that is claiming the mushroom products are being cultivated in North America. More often than not in North America, they're cultivating just mycelium on grain because it's simply too expensive and labor intensive to cultivate fruiting bodies in North America. So most of the fruiting bodies are coming from overseas, from very large mushroom farms. In North America, yeah, you see mostly mycelium on grain operations. And, and for example, so we recently released Arinimax, which is a lion's mane mycelium product, but it is liquid culture. So basically we can grow it in a liquid medium, and then it's very easy to separate the solid mycelium from the liquid. And while we were doing that, we developed an arenosine A reference standard. I think we're probably the first company in the world that has an arenosine A reference standard, which means we can now test lion's mane mycelium products for arenosine A. So arenosine A is a compound that basically only the mycelium makes. And when we use that reference standard to test known mycelium on grain products, we tested one that contained 0.0003% arenosine A. So we call that trace level. It's basically zero. If you look at the product we just came out with, it has 0.5% arenosine A. So that's a, a huge difference. Have you difference. tested any that? Have you tested any that had high levels of arenosine A? No, the highest we found was zero point zero eight six percent, I believe. So that that's something. If you take a high dose, you would be getting some amount of arenosine A. But we even consider that for Arenamax, it's kind of the beginning. Zero point five percent arenosine A. It's not an extract, so we're just getting that from the pure liquid culture mycelium. So we're not doing any sort of standardization. Well, we are standardizing for that, but we're not doing any sort of extraction. Once we do extraction, we can get into the multiple percent range of arenosine A, but currently no one seems to be doing that. There are a few companies that have what they claim is a lion's mane mycelium liquid culture product that is an extract. And we tested them and they were still under that 0.01% threshold interesting like, yeah. what about your own product because th th there's one the truth is like there's one lion's main product that i actually liked and for a long time i wasn't able to understand why lion's main was getting so much hype and mm -hmm. i still don't get it because most of the things that people are trying are actually not very good so i, I was just exactly. not getting it i was like you know what's what's wrong yeah i'm like trying a different one and this one and that one 
And they're all like, they weren't doing anything. They were stimulating my immune system a little bit. Mm -hmm. And for me, that that's not such a good thing because it's like these these mushrooms are usually TH1 stimulants. And when I stimulate my immune system like that, often it's it, I have more of an autoimmune phenotype. And so okay. it, it's often like I'll feel a little less mental clarity from it or like basically just as my immune system is, is being stimulated as if you would feel like if you're, you're, you know, if you're starting to get sick or whatever. But so. Yeah, it's kind of like I felt like they were immune stimulating, but I didn't feel any cognitive effect at large mm -hmm. dosages even, right? And then I tried even one of your lines mains, I, I I don't think I felt a very cognitive effect, but the eight to one extract mm -hmm. where it has eight times the concentration, it's called a dual eight to one dual extract, whole fruit and body. That was the only one that I said, okay, this has a cognitive and, and wakeful promoting effect. So, mm -hmm. so does that one have a or So it called? does not have a A. So a A, yeah. That's a compound that's only being produced in the fruiting body. Oh, sorry, in the lion's mane mycelium. It's not being produced in the fruiting body. In the fruiting body, you have very similar compounds, and those compounds are hericinones. So, but there's a whole class of compounds. Right now, we're just focusing on arenosine A in the liquid culture mycelium because we have a reference standard for it and we can actually test. Now we're working on the fruiting bodies. So with the fruiting bodies, we want to get hericinone reference standards. We want to get hericerin reference standards, hericine reference standards. And then we can go through and look, what are we actually doing with the 8 to 1? Because up until now, and I think basically everyone in the mushroom space you read some research and you go, okay, this research is saying hericinone A is soluble in ethanol. That means we want to do an ethanol extract on it to get that out. But we also want to take some of the water-soluble compounds out, like the beta-glucans are a little bit more water-soluble. So then we do a dual water-ethanol extract. And part of the reason you do that too is because you don't have a whole lot of specificity because we can't do an extraction that's guided by analytical chemistry. And I think that's what you mentioned a little bit earlier. That's really something that sets us apart because we work together with partners that we can do extractions that are then guided by analytical chemistry. So we can say, we want to target these compounds. Can you get them out? And we can ver verify it through analytical chemistry. In the mushroom space, currently, it's a lot of guesswork. And we are standardizing our lion's mane mycelia or our lion's mane fruiting body to beta glucans. And it, it, it's kind of a, a quality, a general quality marker, but all the mushrooms contain beta glucans. All the mushrooms contain very similar beta glucans. There's not a whole lot of variety through throughout the different mushrooms, and they're all immune stimulators. So that's why you got that effect with lion's mane. But the actual compound. Yeah, but I, the. the the eight to one wasn't mm. didn't have the same kind of immune stimulating effect. It was and it has less beta glucans. Effect. Yeah, it, like right. when you do extractions, you actually usually what people think is you do an extraction and everything comes up. But what you're actually doing is you are deleting things, and you're being left with your target. So I always give a good example, like when you make coffee. You have a bunch of coffee grounds, like let's say you have 20 grams of coffee grounds, and then you extract those with water. Now you're throwing away probably 18 grams of coffee grounds or something like that. And you're left mm -hmm. with two grams of solubles that was in the coffee. So it's the same thing with an eight to one. We are able to concentrate by feeling, by guesswork, the bioactives. And leave behind some of the other things, like some of the starches, the proteins, the lipids, some of the beta-glucans, the small portion of alpha-glucans that is in there. And that means you now have a product that is more concentrated than those cognitive enhancing compounds and not the immune-stimulating ones. But the hard thing is, we don't know necessarily what those levels are. So that's kind of our next project now. So Arinamax, the lion's mane mycelium liquid culture standardized for arenosine A. That was kind of our first project. Basically what we did is we took a bunch of lion's mane mycelium that contains arenosine A and we concentrated it. So we have like a reverse HPLC instrument 
that can basically separate out arenosine A based on its molecular weight, and we can purify it. And we have a few talented scientists in the lab that are doing this work and purifying it. And now we're doing the same with the fruiting bodies. So we actually have a grow tent in our lobby. If you ever come visit the New Tropics Depot facility, there's just a giant like cannabis grow tent basically, but it's full of mushrooms. So we are pumping in moisture and we have certain light schedules and fanning schedules. And we have 21 different species of heritium. So not just heritium erinaceus, also looking now at like heritium coralloides, heritium abiatus, some different, very closely related species that have the same bioactives. And we're also looking at different cultivars. So like we have a wild cultivar from the Pacific Northwest. We have one from Pennsylvania. We have one from Virginia. So we're growing all of these different ones and we have a freezer full of biomass that we grew ourselves and we're extracting that now. But we're also doing HP TLC testing, which is kind of like a botanical fingerprint. And with that, we can say, hey, that cultivar or that species contains a little bit more hericinone A potential. We can't quantify it yet, but that's kind of the research we're doing into what is actually the best cultivar or even the best hericium species to be using for the cognitive benefits. And through that process with all of that biomass, we can now also start making hericinone and hericerin and hericine reference standards, which we can then use to actually see why has the eight to one been such a popular product? Because you're not the first person I've heard say this. And for me, it's similar. For some reason, I'm not a big responder to lion's mane. The eight to one, I get a little bit out of. The erinimax, if I take a higher dose, I get a little bit out of. Not hugely. I've never figured out why that is for myself. Other people closely related to me and colleagues and friends, they take the lion's main eighth one and they have like a revelatory experience with it. So why are they having that is kind of the, the next question now. And, and yeah, that, I think that's kind of the magic of Nootropics Depot is being able to do that because we have an in-house lab. So t take me through what, uh, just very briefly, this arenosine A and some of the other compounds in Lion's Mane that are particularly mm -hmm. interesting and what they do that is unique, right? So uh, mm -hmm. BDNF is going to be like every other herbal substance is going to do, <laughs> yeah. you know, not, not unique. Obviously, the big one for, is nerve growth factor, but is, is, there, mm -hmm. is that the main thing? T th take me through Lion's Mane a little bit. So that's one of the main drivers. If you look at the hericinones, some of them are stimulating NGF synthesis a little bit, but the interesting thing is the hericinones actually make the response to NGF more pronounced. So basically the endogenous NGF that's already there acting on the TRKA receptor, if that's happening in the presence of the hericinones, then that response of NGF activating TRKA is more pronounced. So basically fruiting bodies with those hericinones can make you more sensitive to the effects of NGF that's already there. Now the lion's mane mycelium with the arenosine A. Arenosine A, there are a lot of studies on that showing that it induces NGF synthesis. And this is kind of where things get interesting too, because when we came out with the liquid culture mycelium, people were asking, well, is this better than the lion's mane A to 1? And the real interesting thing is that they should really be stacked together because the eight to one would potentially make you more sensitive to the effects of NGF. And then the mycelium is enhancing NGF synthesis. So the two together should be synergistic. But that's basically the main thing with the renosine A. It is stimulating NGF synthesis. It's also stimulating BDNF synthesis. And it is enhancing norepinephrine levels a little bit. So that's, I, I think, really cool because there are not a whole lot of plant compounds that modulate NGF. Like you see it with BDNF for some reason, that's very common amongst a lot of plants. NGF is a little bit more rare, but I think there's some other really interesting things going on with some of the other arenosines. So for example, you have this compound called arenosine S. And what that is doing is it's increasing the level of progesterone and pregnenolone in brain tissue which is kind of interesting because both of those can have mood boosting properties. So somehow, I don't know how it's doing it. The, the research isn't totally there yet, but in preliminary research studies, you can see that arenosine S administration then enhances these neurosteroids in the brain. 
So that's that's very interesting. Cool. Yeah, I take pregnant alone separately. Me too. I yeah. What dose did you take? I take the five milligram dose. So I five, stay on oh, the lower okay. so end. You take the sublingual yeah. one that you guys sell. Okay, Correct. I take fifty milligram. <laughs> fifty. Okay. So yeah. Well, I kind of also fluctuated from fifty milligrams, then back to twenty five. And the reason I went back to 25 was because I was starting to find I had sleep problems with 50. Interesting. Yeah. So because it is an GABA antagonist, it's wakeful promoting. Mm -hmm. But there's two main reasons I think that that was the case because I wasn't exercising enough back when I was doing it like two years ago. And, and, you know, if you exercise, you're going to take that pregnenolone. It's going to go to DHEA, more estrogen, Mm -hmm. more cortisol. So that is one reason why it doesn't have as big of an effect now. And then number two is I started taking more serotonin agents, which, you know, just in general calm my system down. So I'd also get some anxiety if I took too much pregnenolone, whereas with the increasing serotonin with tryptophan and 5-HTP, I don't get that anxiety. And, And also it doesn't cause a sleep problem. So both of those factors were relevant in me increasing the pregnenolone dosage. That's interesting. Yeah, the pregnenolone is such a fascinating one to me because it can turn into so many different things. So we've heard from a lot of customers, either one of two things has happened. Well, three things can happen. It's either kind of anxiety inducing, it's either neutral and they don't notice anything. And for some people, it just knocks them out. Like they cannot take it during the day. And seriously, yeah, Um, I get the opposite. It just, I can't go to sleep with it. Exactly. So that's the interesting thing about the metabolic pathways, like how it's getting converted to different compounds. So if you get pregnenolone turning into pregnenolone sulfate, pregnenolone sulfate is a GABA-A antagonist. And pregnenolone itself, I think, is a mild GABA-A antagonist. And then DHEA and DHEA sulfate are also GABA-A antagonists. So you have this whole set of metabolites that are GABA-A antagonists. On the flip side, Pregnenolone can also turn into allopregnenolone, and that is a really strong GABA-A positive allosteric modulator at the benzodiazepine site. So I also know people... So that when activates they take, GABA just for people. To yeah, know. makes it more that sensitive. That helps activate GABA. Yeah, exactly. So for some people, they get this like really strong GABAergic effect from pregnenolone. And I think dosage also plays a role there. So I don't know if you've ever write about kind of if you increase the feed rate of pregnenolone, so basically you're increasing your dosage, the conversion rate of pregnenolone is a little bit different. So usually it's turning pregnant cholesterol into pregnenolone, and that's kind of the first step in steroidogenesis. So basically all steroid hormones are derived from pregnant. If you take very high doses of pregnenolone, it's going to favor more and more the conversion of pregnenolone to progesterone rather than some of the other stereogenic enzyme pathways. Mm. So I don't know exactly how that would play into maybe your experience with it. Maybe the higher doses you take is also resulting in more sulfation pregnenolone and less maybe conversion to DHEA and the other androgens. But that's kind of why I stay personally with the lower dosage, because the lower dosage, I I honestly, I don't think anyone has an idea in humans what the cutoff is when pregnenolone starts inhibiting some of these steroidogenic enzymes and favoring progesterone. But I kind of err on the side of caution and stay a little bit lower. Seems to work well for me. And there's some guys, have you ever spent much time on the repeat for? No. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) It, it gets pretty wild there sometimes, but there's some good I've, I've heard about the wildness on that forum. I like it's, monitoring yeah. it every once in a while. It's It can be sometimes entertaining, sometimes just like, whoa, what that is I happening bet. here? Uh, and other times, like some really interesting things pop up. And that's kind of where this lower dose of pregnenolone comes from. And people were claiming that with higher doses of pregnenolone, they were getting more like anti-androgenic effects. And with lower doses, they were feeling more androgenic effects. And there was some research that was Yeah, I'd like to see their that, blood yeah. test, though. Exactly. But yeah. <laughs> I think that's, that's king at the end of the day. You got to do those blood tests and see what is actually happening. 
but it's an interesting concept so, that potentially uh, it, it can shut down production of some of the other androgens through increasing feed rate. But does that happen at mm. 10 milligrams or a thousand milligrams? I'm not sure. Right. What about, I guess, uh, you know, I have the five milligram one that you sell, but I, I honestly don't take it much just because I'm not sure. Uh, maybe explain to me why. I mean, pregnenolone gets absorbed pretty well in the sense that if you take five milligrams, you some people can feel it, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Like I, I've never had an absorption problem with pregnenolone. So you've got the sublingual pregnenolone, which... It's micronized, maybe. What, what is the benefit of the pregnenolone micronized and sublingual over just taking a pill or whatever? To be honest, I just chew them up and swallow them. I okay. personally don't notice a huge difference between sublingual and non-sublingual. A lot of people on Reddit seem to claim that they can feel a difference. There, there is no research on it, though. That So what caused you guys to make it just a popular demand like people wanted it yeah we we kind of cooler it sounds cooler we look around on reddit a lot like we're very mm. engaged with the the reddit community and while it's somewhat silly to make products catered towards the reddit community because our customer base is much larger than the reddit community since that's kind of where we came from we always want to make products that kind of cater towards our community in a sense and towards us. So it, right. putting it in a sublingual tablet or putting it in a normal tablet, there's really no difference in production. So if some people... It might really hit in, quicker. Just it might hit if quicker. If you do it sublingually, yeah. you don't have to... Yeah. Exactly. With some yeah. things, I definitely okay. notice that if I take it sublingually, there's a big change. Like... We have the isoliquitogenin, which we recently came out with. If I take that orally versus sublingual, there's a big difference. Tetrahydromagnolol, there is too. But other things like... You do notice a big difference with the tetrahydromagnol? I do. With, uh, sublingually yeah. or... Okay. Yeah. Well, what do you notice from that? Tell me what you think about that. What's your thoughts? So one of the reasons... Tetrahydromagnolol is something I personally wanted for a long time. I was doing some research on magnolia bark. I personally really like the effects of magnolia bark. And at the time, I thought cannabinoid agonists that are not cannabinoids, so like working on the cannabinoid receptors, are really interesting because they can have some interesting effects on pain. I, w I would like a, a, just a short interjection. There's somebody in Nootropics Depot high up that has a lot of pain issues. I don't know who it is, <laughs> but there's so many pain products. I'm like, somebody's got pain issues in this company. I don't know who it is. We, we've all had pain issues. So okay, there multiple you go. years ago, I broke my wrist one time and have a lot of lasting pain from that. And I get migraines pretty often. So for me, there's, okay. there's some motivation there. For the owner of the company, okay. he used to be and still is a big mountain biker and was riding ATVs around and has crashed multiple times and broke his shoulder one time. So he has pain issues. And then, I knew it. I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we have our operations manager. She has a lot of like knee pain issues and things like that. And I see it with my own family members. Like my mom has a lot of knee pain. My dad had a hernia many years ago and was having pain issues. So for me, there's always been kind of, I think pain is such an interesting thing because if you are experiencing pain, it is one of the most anti-neutropic things in my experience. So how 100%. can you get rid of pain, but not cloud your judgment? And I think that's where a lot of the non-psychoactive pain things are interesting. So, right. CB1 so uh, the reason I interjected yeah. was, yeah, because the tetrahydromagnolol is, that's one of the main mechanisms. And I think that's one of the main things that you're selling it for, right? Absolutely. So tetrahydromagnol is normally formed if you consume uh, magnolia bark. It, it just happens during the metabolism of magnolol. Then you get hydrolysis happening and then you have tetrahydromagnolol. Magnolia bark, it's also used in like perfumes and incense. It's kind of an interesting one and it has pretty strong GABAergic effects. And that's also an interesting thing with tetrahydromagnolol it gains more CB2 receptor selectivity and it loses its GABAergic effects. So 
I think the GABAergic effects are still slightly there. It's just not very pronounced if you compare it to regular Magnolia Bark. I think a lot of the GABAergic effects are also because of Honokiel instead of Magnolol, but Magnolol by itself also has GABAergic effects. But then if you turn it into Yeah, I don't notice Magnol. any strong I don't notice any strong GABAergic effects from the Tetrahydromagnol. Me neither. But what I do notice, and even by itself, it isn't the greatest pain modulator ever. Like if you just take tetrahydromagnol, if you're having some aches and pains, it's for some people, it works really well. I've heard some people say like it relaxed their whole body and, and it worked really well for relaxing tense muscles. I don't necessarily get that effect, but it synergizes really well with other pain modulating compounds. So that CB2 mm -hmm. agonism just seems to kick up other things a little bit more. So we like using it in different pain stacks. And I think that's with pain, our thinking oftentimes is you need to hit lots of different pathways because you have inflammation, you have oxidation is playing a role. Then there's also a neurological role in how can you hit all of those different targets. And having a, a CB2 agonist that is not under any sort of regulations is really interesting because most of the other good CB2 agonists can't... I mean, nowadays you can buy them online. Back in the day, you can even buy CBD online. So that was a big motivation of getting a CB2 agonist. On. So I think maybe that if you're somebody who it could improve pain and you could just try it out and see or mm -hmm. improve mood, that's mood is another one. Potentially you could just try it out and see. And, and, and it, I don't think it improves my mood significantly, but... That's really because it depends on where your mood issues are from. It could be more cannabinoid related. It could be more serotonin related, GABA related. That's, Correct. You know, it's quite complex. Uh, I, I do think one, for me, the mood effects are there sometimes and sometimes not there. One of the things that really lowers my mood again is pain. So if I'm having some sort of migraine or like a, a stuck muscle mm. somewhere and I take tetrahydromagnol, it does a good job of blunting some of that pain, but also boosting my mood. If I'm just feeling totally sense. okay and I take it, then I don't notice a whole lot. But what a lot of people notice from it, and that's another thing what's really interesting about CB2 agonists, is they help relax the gastrointestinal system. So for people who have like irritable bowel and things like that, it seems to work well. And that's why cannabinoids are also very popular for those people. And we've heard from a few people that tetrahydromagnolol worked well and other CB2 agonists. So we also have mitadol, which is one that I personally take. That's also CB2. What, what is it helping with the gut though? There's like many problems. Is it gut pain or is it gut like, like flatulence or? But motility. Yeah. You know, uh, motility. So, okay. Yeah. So it'll help with constipation. Yeah. And just like spasms and things like that, it can help there apparently. So I personally don't have any GI issues, luckily, but for people who do, it seems to help quite a bit just for discomfort. I haven't gone super in-depth with these people. Usually on Reddit, it will be like, oh yeah, this was great for some gastrointestinal upset. And same thing with Mitadol, which also contains a CB2 agonist. Okay. I think I'm going to, I need to do some more mega dosing experiments on that. I've, I've done <laughs> yeah. a few of them, but not enough. So I'm going to yeah, see. Be curious. Yeah. I mean, I fixed all my gut issues and then I started taking like tons of fiber, like crazy amounts mm -hmm. of fiber. And then I'm just, I don't have any, I don't have any pain or, or any, it's not like any condition. It's just like, I'll get gas from like some of the supplements. And then I'll give you an example, like NAC gives me gas, but I still want to mm -hmm. take it anyway. <laughs> so yeah. You know, so it's like the all the fibers and a lot of these supplements are give me gas when, especially when they're combined all together. So that's kind of something that I want to now work to uh, get rid of completely. Yeah, maybe a yeah. CB two agonist is is an interesting thing to look at. Maybe even GABA. I, I find kind of interesting because GABA itself is not. I, I don't totally believe the fact that it's not passing the blood-brain barrier because I get very significant GABAergic effects with mega-dosing experiments with just GABA. You but do get a, a significant cognitive effect? Yeah, because when we okay. first started looking into GABA, I, I immediately wrote it off. I'm like, 
why are we even looking into GABA? It's not going to do anything. And but we were thinking a lot of people still mention that GABA gives them effects. So one of the first times I took a gram, which is not a very high dose at all, but I felt some tingles and I thought, okay, there is something going on. Maybe it's a gut brain access mechanism. And then one day I took either four or five grams, again, expecting not a whole lot to happen. But then I felt really like weighed down, GABAergic. I kind of got those like GABAergic munchies, got really hungry for from it. It felt pleasant, like almost a little bit recreational. So I thought, yeah, that's, that's weird. Something seems to be going on. Uh, so, yeah. Seems yeah, I had, a, I had the same initial reaction. I felt like GABA is a placebo because mm -hmm. I don't think it, Presses the, the blood brain barrier. And then I took 10 grams of it. That's and I didn't, dose. I still didn't notice anything. <laughs> and so Weird. I was like, okay, I think this is a placebo. But then I don't know, Andrew Uberman was talking about it as, as if it's like something that's helpful. And yeah. honestly, I don't know, you know, he's, he's a neuroscientist. And so he's like, I, I'm, he's probably getting it from somewhere. Like, I think he takes it himself or, yeah, he said he takes it sometimes. So I, and I was reading up a little more. It seems like it might pass the brain barrier or something, but I'm not really sure what's happening there. I, I think it might pass it in very small amounts. So maybe all you need is very small amounts. So if you take higher doses of it and small amounts pass, that could work. The other theory mm -hmm. is... A lot of the neurotransmitters in your gut can interact via the gut-brain axis because you also have GABA receptors throughout your gut. And I think that's an interesting thing with GABA as well. You have GABA-B receptors throughout your gastro gastrointestinal system, which if you take oral GABA, it could bind there and it could actually relax some of the muscles, the smooth muscles in the gastrointestinal system. So in that sense, maybe it could be beneficial for people with gastrointestinal issues. But maybe through some of those receptors in the gut-brain axis, maybe there is some sort of effect going on there. But it drove me crazy when, when we were beta testing and writing blogs and descriptions for it. I was really trying to find like what's a mechanism that could, could be happening. And one thing that I, I can't really find any very solid proof for it, but I thought there might be a chance that GABA is being metabolized into something else that could pass the blood-brain barrier. So what could that be? One of them mm. could potentially be L-glutamine. So L-glutamine can pass the blood-brain barrier and L-glutamine can be a precursor for GABA synthesis. And there is a chance that GABA is degraded into L-glutamine. There's also a chance, a very small chance, that GABA with the right gastrointestinal environment and maybe microbes could be producing very, very small amounts of GHB. So that mm. would be my best guess. If for some people it is having a significant effect, maybe the GABA is turning into something else that can pass the blood brain barrier, but there's very little research on that. It's kind of hard to research some of these endogenous compounds, because if you look it up, then you get a bunch of studies about GABA receptors and what GABA does in the brain, not necessarily what is oral GABA. Do. Interesting. I was actually looking up, so it, sometimes it's interesting just to see what clinical trials have been done on stuff, because like sometimes you have no idea. You're like, oh, GABA, mm -hmm. this, that. Uh, I'll just show you. This is, so I was looking up pregnenolone. Apparently, mm -hmm. these are the clinical trials. They're not all the clinical trials. These are all the clinical trials based on the reports that we have. But these are like 400 reports. So you see, like, we we're talking about pregnenolone, alcohol addiction, addictions in general, mood swings, and back pain. Yeah. Interesting. And Could so, be maybe from uh, a GABA is a little mechanism. Yeah. GABA. And I don't have any, like, genetic risks for these things here. But you can okay. see, like, stroke, apparently growth hormone, uh, artery hardening, which is atherosclerosis. I mean, and then what was the other one? Oh, lion's mane was a little interesting. So there's, there was low mood, cognitive decline, anxiety. You could also click on this to see. It's a half a gram per day for four weeks, may reduce depression, may help by supporting good sleep. Interesting. Okay. But you could see that my genetic risk here 
has to do with mood. And that's something mm-hmm. that I did have issues with in the past. So, but anyway, yeah, it's just interesting to look up different supplements. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I really like your site um, for that reason. I've, I've seen it a few times myself and played around with it. And yeah, it's, it's nice seeing those the, the content part of it or the application? All of it. Yeah. The content oh, you, is you nice. The applications as well. Okay. Yeah. I, I've looked at it for someone else, not myself. Mm. I kind of looked through their data and, and have seen all of the genetic testing and the recommendations. I think that's really cool. But in terms of the content and self decode, we actually use that a lot at Nootropics Depot. So, oh, nice. or self hacked. I'm not sure. They're two different things or the same thing. Well, kind of the same thing. We transferred okay. a lot of the content over to self decode, okay. just kind of different subdomains and self decode. But we're also going to be releasing a lot of new and updated content. Essentially, what we did was we're, the content that we've been producing for the past two years have all been, three years have all been like internal content within the app. Okay. So it's like yeah. all these reports, all these risk scores, all the recommendations. And we're completing the, like a recommendations database, an interventions database with, you know, so you can type in any intervention, you'll see all the clinical trials that was done on it. Okay. And then That's cool. not only can you see the clinical trials, you could also see how they, those interact with the things that you have high genetic risk for. Mm-hmm. So That's cool. you could just see all the benefits, right? It's like there's a clinical, and then you could click on each thing and, and see where the, the references and impact evidence, things like that. But what's important is you could see where the, like how this is impacting your specific risk. So for example, Lion's Mane showed me that it had like three different benefits, but my specific genetic risk was in low mood. And okay. that was a, a benefit for my specific genetic risk. And you could also, if you upload your lab tests, it'll show you things that are related to your, your genetic risk, but also your lab tests. Okay. So for that, for the lab tests, you kind of need something that has, that, that, that is like much more researched usually. Do you want to hear about the one health hack that is sure to change your life? Okay, here it is. Subscribing to this podcast. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show, so please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, all while helping to keep us ad-free. Have you ever tried yeah. Bacopa Moniri for that reason? Because there, I don't think there are clinical trials on it, but there are pharmacology studies on it that have shown that it enhances tryptophan hydroxylase activity. So have I tried Bacopa? I've tried like 15 <laughs> varieties of them. <laughs> mega dosed. <laughs> All of them mega dosed. Uh, yeah, I've, I've have. And every one of them works differently. Mm-hmm. I find that I get anhedonia from some of them. Okay. So you could see like memory processing speed, cognition, anxiety, problem solving, attention. It's really, all the studies seem to be done with cognitive function. This is my weakness here. People complain that like, I don't multitask very well. I think it's because of this, <laughs> like meaning like I can't, if I'm doing something, I can't have a conversation at the same time. Okay. But anyway, we, we digress. In terms of Bacopa, it very heavily depends on what Bacopa extract. It's like, mm-hmm. that's, it's, I would say that that's the same example of lion's mane. So most of the Bacopa extracts that are standardized for Bacocides, they have, they seem to have more of a GABAergic effect and they give me this, some certain kind of anhedonia and I, I, I actually get worse processing speed, more sluggish. And I think it's because I, it's increasing GABA. Like I feel a GABAergic effect and I already have fine GABA, like my GABA levels are good. So mm-hmm. increasing them more just makes me feel more sluggish. Right. Because I already have a a relatively calm personality in a certain Mm -hmm. way. And so just increasing GABA doesn't doesn't do anything. So but there are certain varieties that I like that increase serotonin more and that and one of them you sell. So that's the Bacognize. Um, Mm -hmm. You guys sell it. it, You know, it's a brand. Everyone sells it pretty much. Mm -hmm. That one does actually work on the serotonin receptor that I think the 2A receptor specifically, even. And 
They, um, they claim 5-HD, if you look on the Verger Sciences website, they claim that it acts yeah. on 5-HT 1A. And I've tried to verify oh, where that's... Yeah. And okay. I've tried to verify where that's coming from, but in, in none of the research I've read, I've seen mention of 5-HT 1A. It's interacting with okay. 5-HT 3A, 5-HT 2C potentially, and some of the compounds act on 5-HT 2A. But you need to do some metabolism so, before you get there. Yeah, but I'll tell you that that one does improve my mood. And my mood is stemming from lower serotonin. Mm -hmm. So it does have a serotonergic effect. I, don't, I can't tell you exactly which receptor, but it's definitely maybe the 1A, maybe the 2A. I don't know. Let's say the 1A, right? I could see it having that effect based on just megadosing it a number of times. And, you know, and, and so... That 1A receptor is also very good for me, I find. Uh, but mm -hmm. really increasing serotonin in general. And so the other ones don't seem to do it as much, but the Bacognize does. Is there any other ones that I like? Have you tried Cognance? Yeah, what do you think? Oh, yeah. yeah, I've tried Cognance. It doesn't have the serotonergic effect, so it doesn't okay. have the same effect as Cognance. So it's not going to improve my mood in the same way. Again, mm -hmm. it's it's... It's not going to have that serotonergic effect. Cognance is a tricky one. It's so it, it's a, it's a little bit of a love hate relationship. Not necessarily hate, but like mm -hmm. love not love. Let's say, yeah. Because so first of all, there's not there's no, there's not there's no clinical trials on ebolin lactones, right? Zero. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's one. And and although two is you always the first make it, dose. yeah. If you consume Bacopa, you will generate ebolin lactone. So it is always important right. for the effects. And if you look at Synapsa, for example, they are probably the first ever standardized Bacopa monieri extract. They developed that at the Central Drug Research Institute of India. So it's actually called okay. CDRI08. Now it's being sold under Synapsa in North America and in Australia, I think, under KeenMind. But if you look at some of the research studies they've done, I don't know why they are not more transparent about this or what they're doing, but they are claiming that they are standardizing for some level of tobaccogenins. And ebilin lactone is one of tobaccogenins. So there has been a lot of clinical research with CDRI08, which is Synapsa. And there seems to be some sort of thing going on where they are concentrating ebilin lactone and other bacogenins, but I don't know to which extent. But Pure ebilin lactone, yeah, there's right. no clinical research on that at all. Yeah, but when you're standardizing something as much as you guys are doing, right, it's taking out some of the other things, and you don't exactly know what of the 300 chemicals in Bacopa <laughs> is causing what and how they're interacting. Now, it definitely, okay, so th that that's one, but mm -hmm. um, I do have it. I did rebuy it as well because I finished it. And and I'm still trying to figure out where it fits in my regimen. It's in this kind of place of like most promising to add, even though I've been, you know, taking it on and off for the past like year and a half or so. And or one of the reasons I, yeah, yeah, it's, I think we released it in November. So it's almost been a year. We released it with Black okay. Friday with this funny video with a DeLorean in it. <laughs> I think I bought it right when it was released. That's what it yeah. was. Yeah. The the reason I bring up Cognance, because it is acting, it seems to be acting, there, there is research indicating that it is acting as a 5-HD2A likely positive allosteric modulator. So there's a lot of likelies in there because a lot of it is coming through modeling and cell level studies, not necessarily in vivo studies and not human studies. But if everything lines up, eblin lactones should be acting as a serotonin 5-HT2A positive allosteric modulator, which is kind of an interesting effect, especially because of your genetic 5-HT2A thing. So I was curious if that worked well for you. So the first time I took it, I actually, I took three capsules. Okay. So it's mm -hmm. three times the recommended dosage. Mm -hmm. I actually felt tired for the first, like, like, okay, so it takes, let's say, a half hour to kick in. I felt tired for an hour to or like a few hours after for some reason. Interesting. And it's supposed to have this wakeful promoting effect. Yeah, because so, when we talk about the yeah. GABAergic thing, 
earlier, and especially with the bacocides, the bacocides are these big glycosylated compounds and they get hydrolyzed in the gut pretty quickly. All of the sugar groups seem to fall off. And then you get jujoboginin and pseudojujoboginin. And those are actually also compounds that are being produced by Sisyphus jujuba, which is a famous sleep promoting herb. And that contains jujoboside A, which is being hydrolyzed into jujoboginin. So we thought, okay, jujoboginin is causing the GABAergic effects. What if we acid hydrolyze that and turn it into the bacogenins like Evelyn Lactone? Do the GABAergic effects go away then? And in our experience, they go away. But I, for some reason, I have heard indeed that some people are still getting some tiredness with it for some reason. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of uncharted territory. And I think that's something we really like at Nootropics Depot, especially kind of where we came from, from the more experimental stuff. And then we started getting into more botanicals. But then we thought, how can we apply that same kind of exploratory being on the cutting edge thing with Nootropics Depot? Obviously, we would like for everything to have clinical trials behind it too, but sometimes they aren't there and you can still get really interesting effects from it. So that's kind of where we stand on a lot of it. Like, can we sacrifice a little bit of the science for like a more like experience driven approach where it, by the way, every single product that we bring out, we like extensively beta test beforehand. So I was saying a little bit earlier before we started the recording, I think that I'm currently, my stack is a little bit more simple because we're beta testing a lot of things. Like last year, we released 52 new products. So that means that throughout the year, I tried 52 new products and the owner as well. So kind of going through and seeing one analytical chemistry wise, <clears throat> we can see, oh, we want this compound. There is research on it. And we can see that the research is saying this compound is having these beneficial effects. But what's the standardization level? Is there other stuff that's not yet in the research, like the other 300 compounds that might be there that might be altering bioavailability or effects in a certain way? And really the only way we can determine that now is just to take it and see, does it work? Which is like kind of exactly the opposite approach that you take, but it's kind of like the wild. It's not, it's no, well, it's yeah. not. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just to be clear, I think I may have left out something. So I, I, th my approach is actually quite multidimensional. I mm -hmm. look at lab tests. I look at genetic predispositions. So if something's counteracting a lot of my genetic predispositions, it's, it's a reason to take it. I mean, it's, it's, it's an additional, like, I, again, I, I balance it against other things. There's mm -hmm. my personal goals. So what am I most trying to optimize right now? And then there's, yeah, and, and I'd say there's also just general clinical trials and looking at all the different benefits in clinical trials. And, and then obviously I'd say the biggest one is my, you know, how I feel on something. So if I don't yeah. feel good on something, I don't care how many clinical trials are on it. I don't care what is, you know, this is, you know, cure all. I take this. I'm going to live to 190 years old. Mm -hmm. If I'm not feeling good on it, I'm not taking it. And so that, that's like an example of like rapamycin, you know, so that's, you know, that's probably the, the, the most promising anti-aging drug out there. Mm -hmm. And I get side effects if I take it at a certain dosage. So I'm just not going to take it at that dosage. Now I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what is the exact dosage without any noticeable side effects. And, and that could be two milligrams either every other week, or it could be two milligrams a week. I've been, I've been trying it out for a long time. But for me, it's like if I'm getting significant side effects from something, then I'm just not doing it. So, I, But in any case, I think like how I feel from something is the number one factor mm -hmm. in, in whether I take something. And that's exactly kind of what we do. Like we want to be very multidimensional in it. We, we want to follow the science as much as possible, but we also want to have the flexibility to kind of go, okay, we know this is maybe not the scientifically appropriate thing to do, but we're going to make a little bit of a venture into this other kind of feeling side while still trying to bring it back to the science at some point. And I think that's kind of with the lion's mane eight to one, we've always had good results with it. A lot of people, it's one of our top selling products and we're slowly working on bringing the science more there, like what in there is causing it. But sometimes you just need to put something out 
and then work on the other steps later. And I think that's something with Cognance, since that is a product that we patented, maybe that's something we want to actually do some clinical trials on. And that would be kind of the, the neo venture for Nootropics Depot is how can we contribute to the science and sponsor some of our own human clinical trials and see what works. But that's a pretty difficult process for, for yeah, a smaller company I'm, I'm a, to undertake. Yeah, I'm a big fan of what you guys are doing. There's not a lot of supplement companies really innovating on making new supplements, essentially. Because, I mean, you could have ashwagandha, bacopa, this, that, and the other, lion's mane, and you can create five different supplements on it. Each will have different effects, and they'll each be interesting. You would take it for different reasons, whereas way back when you would just take lion's mane and that's it. You're just taking what, you know, what one formula and that was that, right? Exactly. So I'm really, I really like what you guys are doing so that, and especially good for people like me who it's like, okay, you've got five of them. I'll buy all of them, try them all out and see which ones exactly. I like. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And sometimes um, it seems a little yeah. bit ridiculous to us too. Like, why do we have four different bacopas and why do we have four different ashwagandhas and like five different curcumins and all fish oils but they do all work differently so we also want to it, like it's an it's an absolute logistical nightmare for us because we just keep adding skews on skews on skews and our operations manager is completely losing her mind at this point because <laughs> we have yeah just... but it, i think it makes you guys unique huh. in that you're creating you're also creating new products that I think you guys took a, a bit of a shift like a year and a half ago because one of the reasons I didn't really buy from Nootropics Depot before is because you had a lot of the same products that you could get elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, okay, it, you know, it's just more of a pricing issue at that point, making sure you're buying from reliable companies. But now you actually have extractions that you can't get elsewhere that actually are beneficial. So, you know, whether I include Cognance, the, the, the type of Bacopa that you guys have mm -hmm. or not is irrelevant. I do think that it has very unique properties. Some people are really going to like it. Some people maybe less. And then the people who really like it is going to help them over you know, their lifespan, which is a long time. Exactly. Yeah. It would be nice if there's just a one size fits all kind of supplement like here, take formulation X and everyone is happy, but it, it's not like that. Like Subroxy is an interesting example. I get pretty stimulated oh, on Subroxy, but I recently gave it to my mom and it just put her to sleep. It's, uh, <laughs> I was like, what, what is going on? Like I get really, it's a very strong stimulating effect for me. And I've heard it from other people too. Like I take Subroxy and it just puts me to sleep. So there needs to be multiple different options for dopamine enhancement or serotonin enhancement. Like some people respond well to Bacopa. Some people don't like the kind of gabergic effects and then saffron is nice, which I guess we didn't necessarily get into saffron earlier, but that is a, a really fascinating one too. There's a couple supplements. There's a couple more supplements that I want to talk about, some of mm -hmm. which you hit upon. So one, is, I'll just go through this maca, subroxy mm -hmm. and saffron, <laughs> right? Okay. So, and, and this is one of the things that, this is why I'm, I'm so into genetics and personalized health because. I'm I'm like, I'll hear, I'll listen to your podcast. I'm like, I literally have the exact reaction, the exact opposite reaction <laughs> that this guy's yeah. talking about. Yeah. I remember you were saying you had like a stimulating effect from maca. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I, I get, it makes me tired. I don't know why. I have no idea why. <laughs> That's funny. It yeah. could be that I get tired. It could be that the cannabinoids get me tired. Cause like some people, you know, they smoke pot and they get awake. Some people mm -hmm. get more sleepy i'm the type that gets more sleepy like i get completely sleepy so it's very interesting like i don't know is it why do you think i'm getting tired from the maca yeah the cannabinoid thing would make sense cb1 receptor activation for some people it can definitely be more sedating so i would say because especially the maca we have so if you look at different macas across the the industry we probably have the highest level of macamides. So that was really the one thing we wanted to get out of it because the macamides are acting as fatty acid amide hydrolyze inhibitors, so the FA inhibitors. And FA basically breaks down the cannabinoids, the endocannabinoids. 
So by inhibiting it, you have things like anandamide and 2-AG, which are increasing in level and can then activate CB1 receptors. So in my experience, the maca has a fairly pronounced cannabinergic effect. That in and of itself doesn't necessarily make me stimulated. There seems to be something else going on. And the interesting thing about the maca stimulation I get, like with normal maca, I get a little bit more of a stimulating effect, more as if I've had like particularly good meal and I'm just having like the energy from digesting some, some good food kind of energy, very neutral, natural type of energy. But from the maca we have with the high percent of maca mines, there's like a weird wakefulness effect. So I don't necessarily feel stimulated, but then I try and go to bed. I'm like wide awake and I've tried it a little bit later. If I'm feeling a little bit tired and I think, okay, I'll drink a cup of coffee or something, but instead trying some of the maca, I notice the wakefulness. I don't necessarily feel stimulated. So. There must be something else going on in there besides the, the cannabinoid effects. But that's, that's a really okay. interesting one and, and a really polarizing What one. do you feel from the maca? Like, what, what do you feel like? What do you feel personally? What would you recommend it for? So when we were first beta testing maca, Erica and I were at the office. We took some and I was expecting not really a whole lot to happen. And then because I never had many major effects from maca, but then like half an hour 45 minutes later i noticed we were like really shooting the shit and laughing and making jokes with colleagues and like really in an elevated mood and then we started getting hungry so it had some really like classical cannabinoid like effects and then i think later too it has a nice libido enhancing effect and it has a good effect on wakefulness. I would say for people who respond well to higher percents of macamides, it could be a good one for just mood. If you're having trouble eating enough, like you need something to enhance appetite, something for wakefulness and something for libido, especially more like acute libido. It's an interesting one. On the other hand, some people, strangely enough, don't feel anything from our maca. They're like, it's completely neutral in effect. I don't notice anything. And then they try a normal maca, like just a, an unstandardized product. And they have really intense stimulating effects and appetite suppressant effects and libido enhancing effects. And I've heard this from multiple people. So I don't really know why it's so polarizing, but might just be because of people's endocannabinoid systems. In a, in a mix of, of a lot of different ingredients. So yeah, what is maca adding? I do think the interesting thing about maca is that it can help enhance overall endocannabinoid tone. And I think maybe that's another thing. Like some people might have higher fat activity. Some people might have lower fat activity. Maybe I'm one of those people who just has higher fat activity. So I have a major effect when I take a fat inhibitor. I noticed the same thing, by the way, for monoamine oxidase. Fat is that enzyme, just for the listeners, it's the enzyme that's breaking down the cannabinoids. So when you break it down, it's, it's not going to activate it much. When, so he's talking about inhibiting it, is go, you're going to have more of these internal cannabinoids in the system. Correct. So just your, your overall endocannabinoid tone is going to be higher. And I think that's also a really interesting thing about fish oils. So fish oil, the omega-3s, they are precursors to a lot of the endocannabinoids. So if you take, especially EPA, if you take higher doses of EPA, you can enhance your overall cannabinergic tone. And for me, that seems to have a good mood promoting effect. So maca is an, an interesting one for that. But yeah, maybe some, some people have high file levels. Some people have low file levels. I know from genetic testing that I have high monoamine oxidase B activity. So when I take a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor, I have really major effects. I don't know if fat is being included on any of the current genetic tests out there. We have all 100 million variants that you could just look up any variant. So if you look at a study, they, there is actually studies with fat. If okay. you just type it actually into the search engine, you could see there's, there's going to probably, yeah, there's a, we have two blog posts on this. Mm. And so you could look at some of those blog posts and see if you have certain of these SNPs. I'll just show you. But this is kind of more of a, an advanced feature. But I just, I'll just show you what I did. I, mm -hmm. I searched for it here, F-A-A-H, and, and, and it just came 
here here it is so i look for the blog and there's actually three blog posts okay and then you could look at you just read through it and see there's it'll show you the different variants and what your genotype is and you could see what the outcomes are but this is a little more hands on right so yeah. Uh, but yeah i mean and and then you could obviously just look up any snip and then search for it and and look up what your variant is so that's that's even more hands on that's cool um, but I'll, this I'll is probably yeah. one of the main ones okay yeah i'll have to check my my genetic testing report from back in the day and see if that's included because it would be interesting to see and it would help explain why I have a really major effect to our maca, and maybe some people don't. Because I've also had this discussion with people. For example, we have a product called Fignatex, which is a fairly strong monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. For me, it produces really stimulating effects. But I've also talked to someone who knows that they have low monoamine oxidase B activity already. And when they take Fignatex, mm -hmm. they don't notice anything. So it almost seems like if you have very high monoamine oxidase B activity and you take a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor, you have a significant effect. In a sense, I would almost expect that someone who has generally low monoamine oxidase B activity, if they're taking then a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor, it would send them over the edge. But maybe they're so much more used to a higher level of monoamines in their system that it just doesn't do that much. And I'm not necessarily that used to it. So for me, it's beneficial. Interesting. The, the mono, the MAO, uh, MOA, monoamine oxidase, MAO inhibitors actually do better. F like I, they, they're actually good for my mood because I think they break down serotonin. Yeah. So you would be looking more at a monoamine oxidase A inhibitor, which is breaking down mm -hmm. more serotonin. Monoamine oxidase B also inhibits, or it, yeah, monoamine oxidase B normally also breaks down a certain portion of serotonin. So if you inhibit monoamine oxidase B, you would get a little bit of a benefit there, but monoamine oxidase A would be more of the one to look for. Mm -hmm. So I see this Vignatex that you're talking about is mm -hmm. mung bean extract, and is that the MAOB inhibitor? Correct. So mung bean, it contains two compounds that we've standardized it for, the phytexin and isophytexin. And specifically, mm -hmm. isovitexin is a fairly strong monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. There's some studies comparing it to some pharma-level monoamine oxidase B inhibitors, and they're fairly close, which is kind of interesting. And when we first tried that one, it, it really had, from my experience with other more selective monoamine oxidase B inhibitors, it felt quite similar. So it was interesting going, ah, mung bean, like I've eaten many dishes with mung bean in it. I would never expect that if you isolated the compound from it, that it would have a stimulating dopaminergic. But not for everyone. And why don't you sell that by itself? Like it seems like it's sold with passion flower. Yeah, we wanted to make a little bit more of a, an interesting, compelling product, mostly catered towards cognitive function. And we wanted to release it on natrium mm -hmm. health. So Natrium Health, we basically only do stacks or slightly optimized things. And when we tried mm. the mung bean by itself, it was nice, but there was like a slight edginess to it. So then we thought, how can we one, enhance maybe the stimulating effects a little bit more and make them smoother? And then we realized that passion flower, we, we were also beta testing passion flower at the same time. Like it was kind of a coincidence and we had them both. And we were trying to figure out what in passion flower is actually making passion flower active. And one of the things that we found is that it also contains phytexin and isophytexin. So we thought, let's beta test a bunch of different passion flowers, see what kind of effects they have. And which was actually really interesting because some passion flowers were strongly GABAergic and some felt very stimulating. And one thing that's also in passion flower is beta carbolines and beta carbolines are also acting as monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So we thought adding in the passion flower, we can get a little bit of smoothing. We can get a little bit more of phytexin and isophytexin, and we can get some more of those beta carbolines in there to kind of round out the uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitor profile because isophytexin is very selective for monoamine oxidase B. But the beta carbolines are not as selective and they also hit monoamine oxidase A. So getting a little bit more okay. of that serotonergic side in there as well. Okay, so let's go to oryxylin A. That is mm -hmm. 
that's an extract that you guys created, right? It's actually an extract. The that, Subroxy? Uh, okay. Subroxy is what Sabinza created. So they're, okay. I, I, I really so. like them. I, what, what else do they make? They make a curcumin product and a few other ones that are really popular on the market. So they're a company okay. that's, they have their own farms in India, but they're based in the U S and they're really big on traceability and you can look into their farms and it's a really interesting company to work with. And for a long time on, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, we try and keep tabs on what's going on in the nootropics community. And many years ago, all of a sudden, all of these research studies started popping up about a Roxolin A and it's a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. And you don't see that very often in natural plant extracts, which are legal. So we started looking into how can we get a Roxolin A and at the time, synthetic so rock. Just to be... Just to so the listeners understand, a dopamine reuptake inhibitor has similar mechanism of action as a modafinil, right? Modafinil should have some dopamine reuptake inhibitor effects. A very... And then atomoxidin. Uh, yeah, that should be a dopamine reuptake okay. inhibitor. And then things like methylphenidate, they riddle in that acts as a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. And the most notorious one of all, the natural one, is cocaine. So cocaine is a very strong okay. <laughs> dopamine reuptake inhibitor. But that's a whole different thing, of course. But each of these do a whole bunch of other things. That's what it comes down to. So it's like, yeah. you know, Adderall is going to act differently than modafinil, than atomoxidin. And I, I think atomoxidin is probably the most specific one. Although uh, I haven't tried that drug. It's a DNRI. So it's a dopamine norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So it's hitting mm -hmm. both. In terms of okay. probably the more selective pharmaceutical dopamine reuptake inhibitor would be methylphenidate or maybe modafinil, but I think it's kind of unknown exactly what modafinil is doing. Like there is some dopamine reuptake inhibition happening there, but there might also be some effects on the orexin receptors and that might be causing some of the wakefulness effects. For me, it's, it's really good for focus and motivation. Like if I'm kind of sitting around and I can't get started on a blog, I'll take some Subroxy, kind of read a little bit of research, and over time I get this more focused, more drawn in, more motivated to write, and then I'll write my blog post. So mm -hmm. a lot of the blog posts are powered by <laughs> dopaminergic supplements, one of my favorites being Subroxy. So it works really well. Erica, who she likes it as well, but it can be very strong for her. But then for other people, it just doesn't work well at all. Interesting. And so you take this every day or what, what do you guys do at the company? Uh, like I, I switch it around. So for like the last two years or so, I was taking it daily and now I've actually taken it out of my stack and it's more kind of an as needed thing because at a certain point it actually started making me feel a little bit like on edge. But it, it's also because I started introducing some other things that are having effects on monoamines. So... Sometimes mm -hmm. I try and switch my stack up and I try and really see what's going on, especially in my environment. I'm very prone to getting like on edge, a little bit nervous. So I like taking more GABAergics, but I also need some help with focus and motivation. So it's always a bit of a balancing act. If there's a lot more stress in my life, then I don't respond as well to Subroxy. So now Subroxy is more of a, like I reserve it as... I need a lot of focus and motivation in a concentrated period of time, then I'll take some proxy. But it's not currently part of my daily stack. And it is interesting in a daily sense because the Roxolin A is also boosting BDNF levels. So it, it is having mm -hmm. a bit of a neuroplasticity effect. So over time, it should also improve in effects. But again, a lot of plants increase BDNF. So you probably have a bunch of BDNF active things in your stack currently. <laughs> right. So tell me about saffron. What's your experience with saffron? What do you think about it? So saffron for me is really interesting because when we first started taking it, we were taking the, the 30 milligram dose that the manufacturer recommends and some of the research studies are doing too. And I felt a little bit odd on it. Like I felt a mood boost. But there was also something that like, it almost felt like, cold and clinical in a sense. So then I thought, what happens if I take 60 milligrams? Does that cold and clinical thing get worse or does it get better? 
And then I noticed that the mood boost went through the roof. It was like very warm and comfortable and it was good for motivation as well. So for me, 30 milligrams is, is not really an ideal dosage. But if I take it at 60 milligrams, it's probably one of my favorite mood boosters that we have. Currently, it's not in my stack because I'm experimenting with some different things. But saffron is one that I usually like to have in my stack. And I think it's interesting because it has a clear serotonergic effect. But in that higher dosage, it also has a unique dopaminergic effect. And one of the potential mechanisms for that, there is some research hinting, not necessarily saying we found that it's acting as a serotonin 5-HT2C antagonist, but there seems to be some indications that I believe it's crocin in saffron is acting as a 5-HT2C antagonist. And what that does, it causes a release of dopamine. So 5-HT2C is kind of working as a, a slight gating mechanism for dopamine release. So if it's activated, dopamine release goes down. If you block it, dopamine oh, release goes up. And maybe that's also why that lower dose was not great, but that higher dose kicked into gear a little bit more. Maybe there's a little bit more 5-HT2C antagonism going on. But I also really enjoy NMDA antagonists like magnesium or things like polygala, agmatine too. They're all acting as NMDA antagonists to different strengths. And saffron seems to act as an NMDA antagonist and as a sigma receptor agonist. So kind of all of that together I think results in pretty unique nootropic and mood boosting effect. And it has some interesting effects yeah. just on eye health and stuff like that. Yeah, so uh, saffron is an interesting one. I actually bought a bunch of different extracts of saffron and I did some experiments with it in the past. And then I just stopped taking it for like a year. The, you know, the, the bottles were like building up a lot of dust. <laughs> and then and then actually I was just looking, I was playing around with, with the recommendations feature. And it turned out that it just came up like number seven for me. Huh, and it turns out that there's a lot of clinical trials. on it. I'm like, what? Well, like sometimes are, you yeah. don't think that there's, yeah, I'm like, what? Wait, what? I didn't know there was like all these clinical trials in saffron. Because you don't hear about it. You hear about like lion's mane a lot more than saffron. And like mm -hmm. lion's mane has three clinical trials. <laughs> like, yeah. What is, there was another surprising one, lactobacillus plantarum. I'm like, what? Yeah. Since when cool is there answer. like all these clinical trials on, on, but anyway, yeah. So for the saffron, yeah, it just, it seemed like there was, you know, so for me, it's like mood, gut inflammation, and there's like all these other ones in terms of, you know, there's preventing diseases, there's eye health. I don't know, there's just a lot of stuff when it comes to saffron. So I'm actually adding it back into my regimen and seeing where it could fit in. Because it's quite an interesting one. T tell us yeah. about some of the different saffrons on the market, right? So, I, I mean, there's, I actually think that most of the sa all the saffrons that I tried were actually pretty decent. Mm -hmm. I, I think I tried maybe two or three. We tried, about I those. think, two or three as well in our initial beta testing. They were also okay. fairly similar. The one we ended up going with had the most boosting effect in our experience. So if you look at the different saffron extracts, you have ones that are standardized to crocin, crocetin, or saffronal. Some are doing all three. Some are just doing one or the other. I think we're doing all three. Saffronal is kind of one compound that gives saffron its unique flavor and, and taste. And it has some of the antioxidant effects and, and maybe some of the mood boosting effects there too. But it seems like the crocins and crocetins, that's where a lot of the mood boosting effects are. So that's kind of where we focused our attention. But they are all fairly similar. I've also tried just taking really high doses of regular saffron, which turns into pretty expensive experiments at a certain point. <laughs> right. Because I've done yeah, the same. saffron spice is expensive. And I don't know if I ever, I think one time I noticed some effects from a higher dose of just high quality saffron but other than that I, I think our extract has been the most consistent so far do you notice a good effect from your your extract yeah but not at 30 milligrams but at 60 milligrams which is double the dose we recommend 
just strange like that you can take something and at a lower dose you're like huh, i don't really like this and then you take double the dose and then you end up liking it you would oftentimes think it's the opposite but i think if you look at certain plant compounds or just plant extracts in general there's so many different compounds in there at so many different levels and bioactivity levels too or thresholds i guess that if you take a low dose maybe you're getting a few effects and then you you up the dose and the pharmacology just becomes more complex and then it ends up kicking into gear. I noticed the same actually with apigenin. If you take 50 milligrams of apigenin, at least for me, it makes me pretty tired and lethargic and it's good for sleep. If I take 200 milligrams, it's clearly dopaminergic and I can take it during the day and it's a good mood booster. And I noticed the same with lemon balm too. Same thing, like lower doses make me tired, higher doses give me more energy. It's strange. How many supplements do you take a day? Let's see. I have them all in front of me. So one, three, four, five. From your podcast, I would, I would expect like 200 a day, but I know that's not the case. <laughs> Currently, my base stack is just 14 different supplements. So of course, some of them are stacks of different ingredients like infinity has a bunch of b vitamins in there oh okay yeah. right so there are ones that that have more but my stack has been bigger i think the biggest it's been is maybe like 20 different things but i okay i never go like super high in it in level because i try and get the most amount of benefits out of the least amount of supplements is kind of the, the one thing i like doing so Sometimes yeah, I'll I like kinda... doing the same thing, but mm -hmm. somehow I I ended up with 150. <laughs> <laughs> I think, especially because I'm sure, like of the 150, a lot of them are also like different nutrients and things like that, and, and that can can really stack up. At Absolutely. least for me, if you split them all out, and that's kind of what I do sometimes. Sometimes I'll just drop everything and make sure that my base is good. So I'll just go like an entire month just taking different types of magnesium, zinc, B vitamins, and, and just kind of the basics and fish oil and stuff like that. And then going from there and seeing, okay, this is my nice baseline state with most of my micronutrients covered. What am I going to do now? And then I start adding things on top and, and, and seeing how can I play with that essential base stack and improve there. Because I feel like a lot of those things are actually the most beneficial for my mood in general. Like if I don't take enough magnesium, my mood is lower and I get more headaches. Same thing if I don't take CoQ CF or just any sort of coenzyme Q10, I have more frequent headaches, which can decrease my mood in the long run. So getting all of that. Oh, let, let, let's quickly discuss that. Why don't you sell mm -hmm. ubiquinol instead of the CoQ10? We do actually also sell ubiquinol. So we have CoQ Sol CF, which is ubiquinol, and oh, then we I have CoQH okay. CF, which is ubiquinol, and then just our normal powder is ubiquinol. But the interesting thing about ubiquinol versus ubiquinol is ubiquinol is a much better oxidation regulating compound. No question about that. I think in terms of cardiovascular health, ubiquinol is ideal. The one thing that I like about ubiquinol is that Ubiquinone is used in the electron transport chain to generate ATP. And of course, ubiquinol will turn into ubiquinone if you, if you take ubiquinol. But when I've beta tested them, I get a distinct energizing effect from ubiquinone. And I don't get that from ubiquinol. And ubiquinone seems to help me more with headaches. So it, it kind of goes against a little bit of the science because everything seems to point to ubiquinol is just superior in all regards it absorbs better it's better for cardiovascular health it's better for the cholesterol effects and all of that but in the end of the day ubiquinone is what goes into the electron transport chain and is the one thing that is essential for making atp because it carries that electron through the electron transport chain i mean i've actually never i've never mega dosed coq10 just because i've always taken ubiquinol because it was like, mm -hmm. okay, this has these, you know, it also has better effects and why, and it turns into the COQ10. It has, you know, so why not also, why not just take the ubiquinol? But now that you mention it, I might 
just do a mega dosing with COQ10 once. Tell me about this licorice extract because it's a relatively new product. I haven't tried it. I just put it in my cart. I try. I, I, just, by the way, I just put it in my cart. Arinamax, I <laughs> the licorice extract one, and the saffron one. Since nice. we've been talking. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, those, those are all great. And the isoliquitogenin is really interesting and has super complex pharmacology. Again, probably a really novel one that doesn't have a whole lot of human clinical trials, but there is a surprising amount of research on it, more animal research. But basically, if you take licorice root extract as a whole, there's a compound in there called glycerism which can have some negative effects. It has some negative effects on cardiovascular health and I think also steroid hormone synthesis. So it's not necessarily great to take whole licorice extract. But the interesting thing about licorice is if you look at a lot of traditional Chinese medicine formulas, they include licorice as some sort of mediator, especially in more of the nootropic and mood-boosting ones. So we've always been interested in licorice. And we did a bunch of research on what compound would be interesting to isolate to then. And then we found isoliquitogenin acting as a GABA-B agonist, which we've always wanted a natural GABA-B agonist. We could never find one. So we were super excited when we saw this research about isoliquitogenin acting as a GABA-B agonist. Interesting. It's also acting as a GABA-A positive allosteric modulator, so it's hitting both GABA receptors. It's acting on vasopressin as well, which the research on that is a little bit lacking, but there's some interesting stuff about social, social ability and things like that with vasopressin. It's acting as an agonist at dopamine D3, but as an antagonist at dopamine D1. So that has some interesting mood implications, I think. And then it's a really But do we want mode. that? I kind of like when I activate my D1. I guess yeah, at night, it's fun. But then on the other hand, it's also a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, both A and B. Mm. So you would also have more dopamine. Oh, but then that's going to get tricky because you want to inhibit the D receptors at night, but then you also don't want to increase MAOB, like the inhibit MAOB at night. So it's definitely not a good one to take it then. It's super tricky. But you don't necessarily want to take it in the day either if it's a D1. Like for me, I do very well with D1 and D2 activators. The one for, for thing, creativity, socialization. The one thing maybe is if it is acting as a low level dopamine D1 antagonist, maybe you're not noticing a very strong effect there, but over time you would upregulate your dopamine D1 receptor. So that, that could be mm. one thing where in a longer period of time it could be having a beneficial effect there. But I really don't know what the binding strength is. What I do know is right. that the overall effects is really kind of goofy. Like it, it, it is relaxing, but it's also stimulating because of that monoamine oxidase inhibition effect and the dopamine D3 agonist effects. And there's probably some other stuff going on that we haven't really discovered yet. So it's kind of like the best analogy I can make to, to a different supplement is caffeine L-theanine, but turned up a notch and a little bit wackier. So <laughs> In a sense that if I, if I take it, like I can feel in a really good goofy mood. And when we were filming those funny videos for isoliquitogenin, I was actually taking isoliquitogenin for filming and that allowed me to be a lot more like creative and free actually. So it's an interesting one for that. Interesting. I really don't know how I can incorporate it into a daily stack. That's definitely one I just I'm, take I mean, as needed. I'm definitely sold just based on the fact that it's a new supplement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a new extract. I'm sold, you know, but I'm, I'm going I'm, to, I guess I'll report back on, on how I feel from it. Yeah, um, it's what you notice, what especially you, with higher doses, because 25 yeah. milligrams, it's pretty, like, it's not super, super pronounced. It can still ride in the background and it gives you this kind of nice, like, flow state boosting kind of thing that you get from caffeine l -theanine. In higher doses, okay. it seems for 50 milligrams, for example, for me, it gets a little bit more psychoactive. I haven't gone any higher. I think the owner of the company has done 75 milligrams and reported it was quite a strong effect. But he actually takes mm -hmm. it daily, the isoliquitogenin, because for oh, him, it's really good for stress. and. Oh, interesting. Okay. 
But P- Poria, tell me about, is there anything, wh- wh- why did you even sell Poria? <laughs> That's a good question. I, it's such a strange mushroom because if you look at a lot of traditional Chinese medicine formulations, ones that also contain licorice root and polygala, almost always there's also Poria in there. But there's like no research on okay. Poria at all. But if you look at the traditional Chinese medicine formulations, it's always in the more nootropic mood boosting ones. So I don't know what it's doing okay. in there. I don't know why there's no research on it. It's a super cool mushroom and it contains. Yeah, there's no research on it. Yeah. I don't notice any like significant cognitive effects. Just it just puts me to sleep. And then like that's that's what I felt when I took it. And then when I want to just like go to sleep earlier, sometimes I'll just take it. Interesting. Um, so it's interesting. I wonder yeah. maybe at some point it will gain in popularity <clears throat> and we'll see some more research on it. I know now if you're looking at kind seven of the, reviews. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. <laughs> not terrible, I guess. But if you look on Reddit, there's there's not a whole lot of mention about it. But some people do really like it. I know there's one in the kind of mushroom cultivation world. There's a guy in the US called Terrestrial Fungi. He's really famous for his like Rishi and cordyceps cultures. And he recently started experimenting mm-hmm. with cultivating poria mushroom. So I hope maybe mm-hmm. that will stimulate the growth of the, the poria market a little bit more. And maybe that will pique people's interest. And maybe we should just do a podcast on it at some point. But the hard thing is we also want to be able to share the science. And there's just literally nothing. If we, if we do a podcast on it, it's it not would be lot. mostly yeah. anecdotal. Okay. okay, so it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I learned quite a lot. I, I really enjoyed listening to all of your experiments and understanding the quality differences in supplements and knowing that the right one to get is, is very important. So I guess if anybody wants to find you or this, you know, Nootropics Depot or whatever, where should they go? Yeah, they can just go to nootropicsdepot.com. That would be a good place to see our products. And I have an Instagram page, not super active. It's pretty chill underscore ND. I post on there sometimes. And where I'm most active is actually on Reddit under a very similar username, pretty dash chill. So I post a lot on our, we have our own subreddit, by the way. So the Nootropics Depot subreddit myself and Paul, the owner who goes under Mr. You are so dumb. That's his username. We are very active on there and interacting with people. So if you have any questions and you want to kind of get involved with the, the Nootropics Depot community and the Nootropics community supplement community, that's a good place to check out and, and interact. And awesome. I guess we have our yeah, own I, podcast I really... too. So that, that's a good one. To yeah, I really out. appreciate everything you guys. Yeah, I appreciate the podcast. I listen to the podcast. I appreciate everything you guys are doing with coming out with the new formulas, the, the, the new novel ingredients, really good stuff. We didn't even go through all of the ingredients that, that I like from you guys, but uh, yeah, a lot of great stuff. So keep on doing great work and thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It was a good experience. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show, so please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, all while helping to keep us ad-free. 